Hey everybody, welcome to this episode of Allure of the Poor, sponsored by Dracina Wines. I'm your host, Lori. I am a UC Davis winemaking graduate, a WSET Level 2 graduate, and a SOM service certified individual. And today I have the distinct pleasure of interviewing Drew Ninao from Ninao Family Wineries. And did I say the name right? I probably should have asked that before we got live, but did I pronounce it correctly? You said it perfectly. One of the few uh, people I have. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Awesome. So I'm very excited because you, everybody who knows me knows how much I adore Paso Robles. I am always, you know, saying how fantastic it is and how, quite honestly, we'd be every other wine region in California and some other areas. So when somebody from Paso wants to get on this podcast, I am all for it. So welcome, Drew. Thanks for having me. All right. So the first thing is we've got to start off, every story starts with an origin story, right? We've got Wolverine, we've got all of that stuff. So what is your origin story? How did you get into wine? How did you fall in love with wine? Well, I grew up in Southern California in in San Diego. And um, while there wasn't necessarily a a booming industry of wine in that area at the time, uh, my aunt and uncle, who in the late 80s, early 90s, owned a restaurant up in Humboldt County. Um, they decided to get out of the restaurant business and, and got into winemaking in the Napa Valley. Um, so when I was really young, I was exposed to these trips to St. Helena, where they lived, and up uh, up the hill to Spring Mountain, where they were building this winery that at the time was called uh, Barons and Hitchcock. And they... Uh, Back then, they were just pouring their heart and soul into it, and uh, they found some success and uh, had the the confidence and had some great scores from Robert Parker at the time and uh, definitely benefited from the boutique winery boom of of the 90s. Uh, And, I mean, let alone their wines were just delicious. But uh, I just kind of grew up around that winery uh, environment. And in in the early 2000s, my dad who was a computer technician for IBM since his early 20s, decided to take up winemaking. Uh, and I can't call it a hobby because he, he wasn't just doing it in our garage. He was doing it at the Barons and Hitchcock Winery, um, uh, which was, was so grateful that my aunt and uncle allowed him to make his wine there. But he was making Napa Valley Cabernet and Syrah, and I was making a lot of those trips up there with him. So, I you know, origin story is that my – love and my introduction to wine was via child labor and uh, <laughs> helping out in the wine cellar uh, here and there. And, and basically, you know, my, as I said, my dad was a computer technician and my mom was an electrician and uh, tech, you know, they're kind of tradespeople. And my dad and I were learning together uh, in my early teenage years about wine and winemaking. And it was such a cool bonding experience for us. And, Mostly what made me transition from just the thought of, that's cool, I'm I'm happy to be having this connection with my dad to maybe this is something I want to do, is watching my aunt and uncle work in the winery. And anybody who works in the industry and works in winemaking knows that there's some painful, um, long hours and just really painstaking time spent to make the wine. And if you're not really into winemaking, it's something that might be a a really tough barrier to get through, but they loved it so much that at the end of a really long day, them and my dad would be leaving exhausted, but happy and Mm -hmm. wanting nothing more, but to talk more about winemaking. And it, it just, it wasn't just a job for them. It was a lifestyle. It was something that they lived and breathed. And as an impressionable um, teenager, I'm, I'm the youngest of five. And so you know, maybe a lot of 13, 14 year olds aren't thinking about what they want to do in life. But I think the benefit of being the youngest at the time was uh, I kind of was. And I wanted nothing more but a job that I lived and breathed what I did and and was able to bring a a level of passion and and love into what I was doing. So that was what got me into it. I actually, uh, I think the moment that I officially put out into the universe that this is what I wanted to do was my eighth grade teacher 
had asked us to write one of those time capsule letters to ourselves, and um, I still have this letter with me, and it's a, it, it says on there that I wanted to attend UC Davis and uh, get a degree in winemaking and, and become a winemaker. Um, I'd even put on there that I want to be a winemaker by the age of 30. So, um, yeah, that, so that's my story. With your teacher reading this. All right, so what's going on in this household that this kid wants to be a winemaker? <laughs> well, a shout out to, to Mrs. Hall because not only was she one of my, my favorite teachers growing up, um, but to this day, she still comes back to me and, and remembers that. And at the time, even was, was so supportive of it and thought it was such a cool thing. Yeah, that's probably not something she reads frequently from, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? Right. <laughs> <laughs> at, at that age, I wanted to be a doctor. <laughs> and I was always getting, you know, Christmas presents, birthday presents, all of that were stethoscopes, you know, the otoscopes for your ears and your eyes, you know, yeah. blood pressure kits. That those were all of my birthday presents and stuff. And then well, when I, I went, wanted, prior to that, I wanted to be a vet. Um, I had a love yeah. of animals. Um, that was my really early childhood dream was to be a vet. And obviously, UC Davis has an extraordinary veterinary program. Yeah. Um, so my mind was already on Davis. So it was a, it was a quick transition, or it was an easy transition from like, oh, they have a wine school too. So um, that's not where I ended up going, but um, yeah. Yeah, they. Uh, I, I realized when I went into college that I was not going to deal with another like 12 years of education to become a doctor. But then. In hindsight, I did more than that because I have two master's degrees plus the UC Davis program, you know, so, but, but, you know, whatever path it takes to get you to where it is, and I, I completely understand it because it's passion, because, you know, the dirt, winemaking is, is pretty on the outside, not so pretty on the inside. So Absolutely. It, it requires a lot of passion in order to do that. Um, so that, go, in your origin story is our First uh, connection is I grew up, my dad is an electrician. So I grew up, you know, um, he actually didn't let me do a lot because, you know, you could really mess things up. But, um, you know, I can change outlets and I can do things like that. And um, so I grew up around and my brother is bringing in, it's a family business, so my brother is carrying on the electrical stuff, so that's our first connection, electric. My mom was a teacher, so uh, so there we go. So um, the second thing is, you had said that you were in San Diego growing up, so I mean, I love San Diego because there's a lot of beer, and you, I mean, you've heard the saying, right, it takes a lot of good beer to make great wine. Right. So, um, what do you, what, what's your favorite beer? Do you, well, first of all, do you follow suit with that? Do you drink the beer? Do you drink beer? Yes. Okay. Uh, I think during harvest time, my, my beer consumption, it, it, there may be more beer than food intake yeah. at times just because of the shit. It's a little easier to drink a beer than sit down and eat a sandwich or something like that. Yeah. But, uh, big time. Uh, right now, I'm really into the Barrel Works program. Um, at Firestone Walker, oh, okay. they make a lot of these really small, uh, handcrafted uh, beers over at Firestone. And a, a friend of ours, Eric, is is the cultivar, the uh, the creator of these really awesome wines. And uh, he makes this milk stout that's called Mother's Milk, and I think that's probably my favorite. Oh, I've had that. I've had that. There's a local um, like wine bar here that has beer on tap, and I've had that. That's yeah, kudos to it's him. It's not exactly the best thing on on a really hot uh, summer or fall day, but it, damn, it's a it's a good beer. And it, it's a meal. It's a good meal. <laughs> yeah. um, I I think right now I'm on the I'm on the Barrel House Juicy IPA kick. Mm -hmm. That is that is where you know I just go in. Give me my juicy. Give me my juicy. <laughs> yeah. Part of 2018 uh, kind of ruined the juicy for me. Maybe uh, so. I'm the winemaker for Onyx Wines as well in in Tin City, um, which is maybe a hundred yards from Barrel House. And 
Uh, that's our we drive our forklift from the winery. Uh, we take turns driving the forklift up to Barrel House, parking it, going in, grabbing a couple six pack, and taking it back down for the crew. That's our uh, that uh, probably happens every other day. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you can kind of get a little burnt out, I guess. That's true. <laughs> but it's so, good. It's very good. Yeah, yeah. Um, my second, our second connection is you were a volleyball coach, or you are you still a volleyball coach? I had to give it up, unfortunately. I was going to uh, say, how are you doing all of that? <laughs> yeah. This was my first year. 2020 season was the first year I didn't do it. So 2019 was my last year coaching. Ah, I coached volleyball for, oh, God, I don't know, 12, 12 years. Wow. Yeah, coached volleyball and um, and boys swimming. Was it boys volleyball or girls? It was girls volleyball, boys swimming, girls volleyball. Out so, there in, in Fresno? No. So we are originally from New Jersey. Okay. So it was in New Jersey. That, yeah, that that's I did why it. there wasn't boys volleyball. <laughs> Correct. Our our boys volleyball is in the spring. Oh, okay. So our our season would be girls volleyball in the fall and then the swimming was winter and then boys volleyball is in the fall, which I had done softball for a while. So I even coached softball. But uh, I want I wanna get back into it one day once uh things aren't so busy in our lives and our our children aren't so little. Um it really felt like a way to give back to the community in some ways and work with some youth and um, the Pastoral Bowl. Uh, one thing that I was astounded by when I started doing it at Pastoral Bowl's high school was um, the statistics on um, the a lack of male father figures. Um, really? For the men, the young men at, at that school. Um, and that really drew me to it. it. I went into it with a desire to compete because that's, just part of me and it became something totally different that was even more rewarding was um, to be able to work with some of these young men who are now college aged kids, some of them. And, and I can call them friends now, not, not, you know, players. So now you're players. I love that side of it. Wow. That, that, that's amazing. I, when I left coaching, I missed it. Um, but because of how much time it takes to coach and you know, I'm sure like you're not one to just I'll show up and collect a paycheck type thing. I, you know, um, go scout, do all this stuff and everything. I then went into officiating. So it was it was really a nice way to stay with the kids and see them. And, you know, you kind of get into a rotation of the same schools. So you see them, you know, grow up and you see them start when you officiate, you do a JV match and the varsity match. So you see them as, you know, youngins doing JV and then you see them one year become varsity player and then they graduate. So it was really nice. It was a nice way to stay with the game and mm-hmm. stay with kids and even more kids because, you know, you're moving from school to school. Um, but a lot less you know, a necessity to be there. You know, game starts at four, I'm there at quarter to four. No, you know, so uh, you can but think of that. But kudos to you because uh, the people that, that officiate those games are some of the best individuals. They have such a high volleyball IQ, and it's it's somewhat a, somewhat a thankless uh, job. I have at to be yelled at. <laughs> yeah. You get yelled at a lot. You get yelled at a lot, but that's okay. You know, you kind of uh, – the you know, being from both sides of it, you know, I get it. Uh, yeah. My my all-time favorite was I was the up official for a game, and it was a county game, and uh, this girl whose back was towards her bench, right, right next to me goes to die for ball but carries it, right? And as she's carrying it, she's like, oh, shit, right? And I call it. And the coach is like, what are you talking about? That was perfect. And I looked at him and I looked at the girl. I said, you know, come on, you know, and she, she went, <laughs> you know. And then after, after the game, the coach came up and was like, oh, it was such a lift. But, you know, what am I going to do? I've got I've to argue it. You know, maybe right. I think the next call, you know. Yeah. Um, so it, it's a fun way to do it because you, 
it's fun because you don't have that competitive part of it. So maybe when things calm down, you can think of it that way. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I'll transition to coaching girls volleyball and and try and coach my daughters when they grow up. That's that's okay. the next dream. There you go. That's that would be nice. That's nice. Yeah. So back to wine. You mentioned that you're also the winemaker for Onyx. So how did we get into how did we get into that gig? Because you've been in a lot of places prior to that. Is is Onyx your first head winemaker position? Yes. So prior to that, back to where I left the story of my origins, um, I did not end up going to UC Davis. Um, instead, I, I visited Cal Poly San Luis Obispo oh. and just fell in love with that region in San Luis Obispo County. Um, and I was also still into sports at the time and wanting to play football, and, and there was some interest in walking on there. So it, I was able to study wine in a in a true accredited uh, enology degree and also have this pursuit to continue to compete and uh, decided to, to make the jump there. So that's how I got to San Luis Obispo County, uh, spent four wonderful years at Cal Poly, graduated, and it was really my uncle and my aunt and my uncle, Lisa Drinkward and Les Barons, who uh, when I was talking to them about my career path and they were the ones that said, you know, at Napa, kind of, that we've been here long enough, maybe you should look at working down there. Paso is this hot region. It's really, be, I really believe it's making some great wines. You should work there. Um, so I'd worked a stint at Turley Wine Cellars for a little bit and just Not got too the, shabby. <laughs> no, I just, I just wasn't a, a, a sponge while I was there as I got to work around uh, Tegan Pasalagua, who was the associate winemaker at the time, Aaron Jordan, who was the winemaker at the time for the whole brand, and then the winemaker of the Paso location, Carl Wicka, um, continues to this day to be a, a huge mentor for me and a, a confidant, and just somebody I can call whenever. Um, so that was a hugely helpful experience. And then I cut my teeth at, in a seller assistant job, just doing – grunty cellar work at Villa San Juliet in Paso um, before I came across the job posting for basically an enologist um, assistant winemaker position at Onyx. So interviewed at the time, the uh, Onyx was still operating out of the owner's garage. And uh, so we had little cubicles in, in his garage in Templeton. And uh, <laughs> that's where I first started. And then um Within the first couple of weeks, I was at our Tin City Winery and um, was, of all things, tasked to do a lot of the electrical work on the building. <laughs> um, I guess they knew a bit about my past, but yeah, I was wiring things most days and, until harvest hit. And uh, yeah, I was, I was the assistant winemaker for a few years and, and then um, was offered the head winemaker position in 2018. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well... I love Field Day. Oh, thank you. Like, oh, like, I love it. Like, we go in and I'm like, all right, Field Day, Field Day, Field Day. You know, it's it's a beautiful wine. It really is a beautiful wine. So, but not a lot of Sauvignon Blanc in Paso, but um, no. that property does it really well. Uh, it is. It really is a beautiful wine. So, kudos. Thank you. Um, so your first actual harvest, no, you're saying 2018, but I had it as 2017. Um, so 2017 was the first vintage of Ninal family wines. Oh, okay, beautiful. Yeah. So um, 2017, so you're looking now at your third harvest coming through. What, um, what has changed from your first harvest to now your third harvest? And can you believe it's already your third harvest? Well, this will be our fourth, so 17, 18, 19, and then 20 oh, right, right. That will be our yeah. fourth. And, and I'm doing years and not vintages, yep. And I think we were um, extremely lucky in a way in, in the fruit sourcing that we got that first year in 2017. Um, I mean, we got Bien Nacido. Um, we found this, this vineyard, Rigetti in Edna Valley. Uh, uh, thanks to a friend, Nick Elliott, from Nakora Winery here in Paso. Is that the Rigetti? Yes. One of my favorites. Um, 
Uh, thanks to Nick Elliott at Nacora, um, got some Grenache from La Vista Vineyard in Paso. But essentially what's changed the most is that back then I felt like I was begging people and basically only got my hands on good fruit through the good fortune of some of the other winemakers that I knew in Paso. And conversely, now in, in 2020, um, going into the year and thinking about our fruit sourcing, we had options. And um, we were sourcing from a vineyard in, in Paso called Full Draw now, which is one of the most sought after vineyards to get into, and Alta Kalina, which is high elevation, one of my okay. personal favorite terroir driven sites in Paso. And um, yeah, as I said, it's just we went from begging to kind of being able to look at a, a, a list of vineyards and, and picking and choosing where we wanted to be. That is, that is nice. That is nice. I noticed that like, um, for us, because we, we started with one wine, cat, one Cab Franc, and then mm -hmm. we've expanded out to, we have three wines and with this vintage, uh, we'll have four. We're, we're doing a Chenin Blanc, uh, with this okay. vintage. Um, we figured, you know, if you're going to make a white with a Cab Franc, it should be Chenin Blanc. Yeah. <clears throat> so what we've noticed is the more connections you have, like it's a little easier, oh, we need a little blending wine or we need this or, you know, we need that. Um, and through connections, our Chenin Blanc is actually coming from Clarksburg, not Paso. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's still through connections that we've made along yeah. the way. And one of the things that I love about Paso since the very first day we discovered it, really, was the people. Like, I, I think the wines are stellar. I think that the soil is amazing. I think, you know, like, we make quality wine in Paso, but what really makes the difference is the people. Thanks. Well, it's a, I, one of the things that I've been blown away by and noticed from day one is there's not this immense amount of competition. It's a very competitive field in, in that um, there's a lot of wineries and only so many people coming in town and buying wine, but it's from a winery to winery standpoint, a, uh, a rising tide raises all ships mentality. And um, there is, especially working in Tin City, there are so many resources around you that if something breaks, I don't know how many times people have come to us or we've had to go to other people when we're, we have a piece of equipment that went down at a crucial time. And it's not even a question. It's not even like people are like, hey, Kimmy, like they are on it. And even if it slows them down, they are willing to help. And I love that mm -hmm. culture. And I think it's one of the big driving reasons besides just the incredible farming that's going on, but for the increased popularity of it, there's just a really, really positive culture to the area. Yeah. yeah. And you, you said it perfectly. That's what I think. We never have an issue with like, if we have a technical question or something, you know, people are always willing to help out. You know, um, I remember when we first got into it, our 2013 uh, vintage was from the West Side. It was actually West Side Ranch. Mm -hmm. And um, we went in and we found out that Dark Star got fruit from the same vineyard. Mm -hmm. And we went in just to go taste their Cap Franc and to see, like, what they tasted like or whatever. And when we were talking to, and I forget what her name is, which is horrible, but the wife um, back then, um, when we talked to her, she's like, oh, hold on a second. Let me go get Norm, you know. And, and, like, Norm came out of the field to come talk to us to tell us what's the positives of that vineyard, what's the negatives of the vineyard, what you need to pay attention to. Like, and we were blown away because, you know, it's, you're literally talking Cap Franc, Cap Franc from the same exact vineyard. Right. And he spent like two hours with us helping us make that first vintage, you know, and um, it just, it's incredible. The people, the people are what makes the difference. Absolutely. And in Tin City, I really think that takes it even a step, a step up, a notch up from that. It's almost like a social experiment um, at times within Tin City and the different personalities. And uh, but it's one of the huge reasons why I wanted to work at Onyx um, was to work in Tin City and and uh, be able to witness that social uh, uh, experiment. 
Now, are you making your wines at Onyx? I had been. Um, as I worked out uh, buying some fruit from the Full Draw Vineyard, um, Connor McMahon, who's a friend of ours, had he just finished his winery on the property, and he basically said, I have a little bit of room here to make wine. Wouldn't it be easy if the fruit just came right out of the vineyard and into the winery right here? <laughs> yeah, it would. So um, <laughs> this year we're, we're making our wine over at Full Draw. Oh, very nice. Yeah, it is pretty nice. Our our fruit comes from well on Wellsona from Plummer Vineyard, and uh-huh. then our winery is on Dry Creek. So it's like a five minute drive, and yep. it's it does make it a lot easier. <laughs> it really Fun. does. Like in, environmentally, to not have to truck that fruit around, and it's just it seemed a lot more ethical um, to do it that way. Now, what about a tasting room? Do you have one, plans to have one? We actually just announced the opening date of a tasting room that we've been working on up on Peachy Canyon Road. Oh, okay. Um, so our tasting room is opening the weekend of August 29th. Um, so Thursday, I think actually a Thursday, August 27th will be the first day that we are seeing tasters. And do you have an outside space? Yes. It's okay. the the tasting room itself is a kind of offshoot of an old uh, nut like walnut processing barn okay. um, the indoor space is maybe like the tasting room itself is maybe 600 700 square feet um, and then it's got a 800 to a thousand square foot deck on there the front you go. Of it. so <laughs> it's mostly outdoor space perfect perfect how far up on peachy canyon about five miles out of downtown. It's mm-hmm. literally across the street from Law Wine Estates. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, yeah, it's the right former there. Nadeau. Um, I think right now on the map, it's it's on there as Nadeau Family Vine- uh, Vintners. Um, okay. We work with Patty and Robert Nadeau, um, and they're leasing the space out to us. Oh, very nice. Very mm-hmm. nice. That's a very nice area. Um, okay, so what is your favorite part of the winemaking process? And then you know what the next question is going to be. <laughs> well, I, can I do two? Because there's yeah. two that I, I can never decide between. Okay. Um, and they kind of go hand in hand a little bit. Um, one One's on the very front end of the process uh, and the other's at the very end of the process mm-hmm. in that I, I love the aspect of terroir. That's why for those of you who want to go check out our wines or taste our wines, you'll find that we do one blend Otherwise, every other wine that we do is a single varietal, single vineyard designated uh, wine. And that's because I I love the concept of terroir and the fact that just climactic differences in the soil and the temperature and the aspect and uh, everything that goes into terroir expresses wine differently. And I just think that's such a powerful thing that Mother Nature is dictating what these wines will be like and you know, on a microspective level of terroir, but then also a macrospective level of weather trends, uh, global warming, or um, just these things that you almost have to, you have to work with Mother Nature a lot of the times. And I just think that there's such power in that. Um, and to sit there and have, and then this is how it's tied together, just to sit there and have a finished product that expresses those um, elements is just so cool. So that's the other part is the very end, the wine that's in the glass, to have something that you put all this energy into and worked with Mother Nature on and, and cultivated into this beverage that you now have a physical culmination of your work in, in Mother Nature's work in a glass. Again, powerful, mm-hmm. just something that there's not a lot of things that like, you know, maybe construction workers, you know, there's a building out there after they do all this work that they get to view upon, but nothing as hedonistic as a beverage that I then get to consume and, uh, um, you know, get a nice little buzz on too. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So, uh, isn't it like an incredible feeling? Like we'll go to a restaurant here that carries our wine and we'll be sitting at a table and then, you know, the waiter will come over and hand somebody or a bottle of wine, you know, and like you sit there and it never gets old. Like it just doesn't get old to see somebody enjoying the literal fruits of your labor. Right. Right? Absolutely. All right. So now the opposite 
least favorite part of winemaking? Oh man, that's that is a much harder question. Um, and I think I think the only thing I can come up with is a uh, is a pretty boring answer in that all I want to do is is be in the winery and or like in the vineyard or in the winery or or pouring the wine for people and talking about it. But there is this whole other logistical side of winemaking where there's all these writing of work orders and administrative <laughs> detail where you just have to you have to be on top of that stuff. It re, it's required and it's really hard for me sometimes to sit down and sit in front of a computer screen. That was it's one of the things that I wanted to do wine because it was something that you work with your hands with and not necessarily are sitting behind a computer. And for me personally, uh, that sounded attractive, but um, I noticed pretty early on that the less, the higher up the totem pole that you get and the closer you get to a winemaker title, the more time you have to spend in front of a computer. So um, I've, I've mitigated, I have an awesome staff at Onyx who are just rock star, not only on, in terms of intelligence, but work ethic. Um, and they're very thoughtful and they know that I like to do cellar work too. So I just, I, I, insert myself sometimes to the cellar work and, and get to do those things just because it scratches my itch. Yeah, because yeah. compliance is not fun. No. The, the, like, we, we do it all, so we're, we're the compliance, we're the, the marketing, we're the sales, um, we're the packing, we're the, we're the everything, um, the, the, the movers, everything. Uh, I, I agree. All of that paperwork is, is the worst ever, and then Shipping to different states. This state uh -huh. wants it documented four times a month. This state wants it documented once a month. It, that's what I hate. That is yep. that is what I hate the most. And, and I, that side of sales too, like you know, yeah. the, it, it's different. It used to be um, people would flock to you, or you just get phone calls off the hook about selling your wine. And, and the industry has just grown to a certain point that it takes a lot more work now to get out in front of people and there's so much more competition um, that you just have to work harder on the market uh, right. than what I remember um, people having to do in the 90s and early 2000s. So um, it's it's a necessary evil for sure, but um, I wish I could just sit down with people and, and pour them wine and, if I, you know, take the good with the bad. Right. That's, uh, what, so what's your case production right now? We're about 550 to 600 okay. cases a year. Okay. Um, yeah. So where do you want to be? Where? What's your sweet point? Well, we have this uh, we have this model that's all centered around our um, our membership, our our family club, as we call it, um, where that 550 cases we can support about 225 club members within that production level. So okay. the structure of our club is a little bit different than others in that we have this founders family club that we're building right now um, that we're at about 100 and 130 people. Okay. And when we get to 225, we're closing the club and then we'll make a, a concerted effort to increase production so that we can then start bringing in other new club members but what happens when we when we reach that threshold of 225 people, our prices are going to increase. But those folks who got in on the ground level will never pay a dollar more for our wines than how they're right now. Oh, wow. So it's That's a tiered system easy. that if they believe in us early on right now and they want to sign up and they believe that the wines are of a quality and they, they want to stick around to see what um, what will become, they'll be, they won't necessarily see a, a – uh, discount right now, but in the future, as we grow, they will purchasing into the future. That that's a unique concept, and that's awesome. Um, where once you have these people in your founders club, and now you start increasing your price, increasing um, increasing your um, production. Where do you where do you want to be? Like what what case production do you like I don't want to go any further than that or do you not have that I don't, it just depends on you know I think it keeps me accountable to the quality of the wine that 
um, it'll it will only grow as quickly as we can support it to grow. You know, so if that means one day it's a uh, three to four thousand case production, um, as long as it doesn't lose that feel of being a personable experience mm -hmm. and the people in the family club feel tied to the product and and believe in us as a company, um, that's our overall goal. I, I would never want to, it's never going to be more than a boutique winery. Um, and especially I, I owe so much and, and there's such amazing plans for what is in the future at Onyx that um, I have to manage both of them right now. And, um, and I, I have unfinished business at Onyx and, and I, I want to see that through. Yeah. So uh, it's going to be a really slow growth as we go, but we're we're going to continue to produce some really fantastic wines and slowly build. I think that slow build also allows us to have that personal connection with those members that come in. We don't all of a sudden take on a hundred new people that I only know five of them. You know what I mean? Right, right. My my answer when somebody asks me that question is. I'll know when I no longer can be the person behind the counter talking to the people who are drinking my wine. You know, that one, it, that's the slide. Yeah. 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 Well, I don't, I don't have an exact number, uh, you know, uh, mathematics wise or, you know, tax wise or selling wise, there's kind of a number that you'd like to be at so that it kind of makes a little more sense. Um, and, you know, you actually start to see a positive in the income versus <laughs> dishing right out. But, right. I don't ever want anybody else telling my story. It's it's our story. It's you know, so when we get to the point where I can't be that person, and I think that's kind of the same thing you're saying is if you're the, if people are coming in and you can't be that person who's representing your wine or you know, then you don't want that. Absolutely. That's that's I think a very good good way to to look at it. Now going back to what you were saying, you did. You, uh, when you were at Cal Poly, you kind of also worked in tasting rooms. So, what, how beneficial, or is it not beneficial, was it to have that experience while you're now your own winemaker and your own label? Oh, it's hugely important. Um, you know, while a lot of my experience, although I have a degree, I would say a lot of my winemaking knowledge comes from the mentors and people that I watched making wine. That's just something that's been, you know, privilege wise available for me my whole life. I'm so grateful for that. Um, but I, I've heard so many winemakers, I can't even pinpoint one person that told me this because there's been so many is that it doesn't matter. It, sometimes uh, you can make the best wine in the world, but if you can't sell it, it doesn't mean for anything. Right. Um, so while working in tasting rooms, I started doing in college as a means to, you know, provide for myself during college a lot of times. Um, it became this experience of a forward-facing ability to uh, convey passion and convey winemaking and just generally connect with a consumer and have an understanding of the different levels of knowledge that people have and, and be able to articulate what you're doing from a winemaking standpoint to the end user based off of where they are in their wine experience. And uh, that's hugely important to be able to, because at the end of the day, wine is not a normal product. It is a product built around passion and, and farming and artistry. And um, if you can't convey that message to somebody, then it's a hard sell. Right. right. Yeah. Now you source all of your fruit, correct? Correct. Yeah. So I had read an article, and I literally wanted to jump through the magazine and strangle this psalm who was declaring the best fruit, how to buy the best wine, and all of that stuff. Um, and he was listing, these. this is what you need to look for in order to have a quality wine. And one of the things he said is that all fruit needs to be a state. And I went berserk and screaming. So... We source, and I have very definitive beliefs about sourcing. So what, what are your thoughts, positives of sourcing fruit? Um, mobility, the ability to always be looking for um, 
better sourcing, I guess. Um, and for me personally, I, guess, I always say that a lot of our wine production and how it's organized and structured is pretty selfish, really, um, for me personally, because uh, I, I'm the one who gets to drive around to all these vineyards and, and um, a lot of the time the choice thereof, they're very beautiful places. And um, one of my favorite things about winemaking grape growing in particular is the relationship that you have with a grower and somebody who is tied to the land. So within a state, you you know, you get to pour yourself and you have a lot of flexibility over the farming and it's never really a conversation. If you want to do something in a vineyard, you can do it. Um, but it's missing that human element of working with a grower who is passionate about growing grapes and then that grower working with someone who's passionate about the wine that they can make from that grapes. That is such a special connection. And to year in and year out work with growers and to go back and taste the wines that you made from their grapes, they one thing, they, they light up about it. And again, from a winemaker standpoint, there's nothing better than to have someone just light up over tasting your wine and then get to work with them like, okay, this is what I want to do. This is what I'm thinking we can do this year. And that back and forth is such a cool experience and in, in human interaction and, and uh, finding common goals with, with another person. And uh, I think that's my favorite part about sourcing is, is building a trust and a relationship with those growers. And obviously we can make spectacular wines using sourced fruit because there's loads of fantastic, you know, ratings out, excuse me, ratings out there and, you know, for, for our wine. So it's possible. Um, I love that same reason, that, that same exact reason for sourcing. And I, I always say, you know what, I'd rather be a master of one than, you know, a jack of all trades. You know, mm -hmm. I love winemaking. I love that process. I don't necessarily want to be in the dirt growing that. I'm going to let you guys who, you know, I love being in the vineyard. I mean, every time I'm there, I'm, you know, you're looking and I, I love sampling and doing all that stuff. But the growing aspect is not my passion, you know. Um, and th when you find that connection between a grower and you, some connection, it, it just makes it so much better that, you know, and I, so it's the same thing. I don't, I don't ever envision myself having a state fruit. I mean, we might have vines on the, you know, so it looks pretty, but um, I don't expect ever to have a state. Do you ever envision yourself having a state fruit, an estate bottled wine? Yeah, the same thing with you. If we had a property, um, I do love the connection of, um, that like person to vine as well. Like what makes me upset is that uh, someone who just broadly declares something like all the best wine is a state fruit. Right. Like that totally ignores aspects and, and doesn't appreciate differences in situations. I mean, that could be expanded to a whole nother level of politics too within this country. Right. But um, basically when it comes to fruit sourcing, it's, uh, we, if we had a, a little property and we could grow some vines on it, I would love to do that. But I, again, as I said, I love terroir. I love the aspect of terroir. And I want our portfolio of wines to express different growing places broadly. If you want a diversified lineup of wines within your portfolio, then buy from different vineyards. Because mm -hmm. even a state sourcing, some of the more uh, successful estate uh, brands are ones that own multiple properties because they want uh, diversification or yeah. um, like Onyx even owns two properties, one in Templeton Gap, one in Willow Creek. And they're polar opposites as mm -hmm. far as the way that they express themselves. And uh, again, the, you're just totally missing out on an, a fantastic aspect of winemaking and grape growing if you're tying yourself to one piece of land. Right. There's, there's zero diversity there. If you're mm -hmm. on, on the same soil, it's got the same climate, the same microclimate, everything. You're not. So I really did want to go through. Um, somebody was like, that's a French song. That's how they that's how they deal it, with it in France. I'm like, well, it's still stupid. It's still, it's still a, a horrible, horrible statement. 
Yeah. <laughs> so let's get to your wines and your diversity. So first, Bien Nacionado. Oh my God, like that's like the bow down of vineyards. Um, but you currently make five wines. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, I don't know what order you kind of want to go into. I have the Grenache, the Rigatti. Mm-hmm. So these are your first labels. I don't know if this is what you call your first label, but since we're going to talk about this first. So I love it. It looks like marble. Um, is there a story behind how that was designed? Yeah. For uh, for those who can't see it, it's a marble background um, spliced up in different sections of, of cracked uh, gold, like ornate gold. And the story behind that is I, I mentioned that I'm one of five. Um, but that five is a collection of uh, siblings and half siblings, and um, essentially our our home is what you would call um, somewhat broken of divorce and and whatnot. But it's nothing of the sort. Um, it's this this modern situation of uh, my parents had former marriages in which they had kids and and then had divorces and came together and had my sister and I which just sounds like this really tumultuous situation, but in fact it was a beautiful place to grow up in with um, all these different sets of family members, and and I just really loved my upbringing and my siblings. And um, this project is a uh, a cooperation. A uh, my partners in this project are my sister and my brother-in-law, uh, as well as my wife. That's our our team. And when we're just thinking about who we were down to a core as a company. Um, I came across this kintsugi Japanese bro- broken pottery art, which is a art form where they take broken pieces of pottery and they stitch them back together with ornate gold and create this even more beautiful piece of pot- pottery um, than it was before it was broken. And that just seemed like the perfect uh, symbolism for our our family and our upbringing. So. It just really spoke to us to a a childhood level. That's awesome. I love it. It's it's a beautiful label. It really it really is. It's eye catching and it's not like in your face either, you know. Um, but when you have a connection to the story behind it, it makes it even even uh, uh, better. So this is Rigetti Grenache, which I absolutely love Grenache. I am not familiar with this vineyard, so can you tell me about the vineyard and why you, you, you're you sourcing from there, what you like about that that terroir from there? Well, I fell in love with Rhones pretty early on, and, and as you can see, all of our wines are, are Rhone uh, varieties. And one of my early uh, influences as far as drinking Rhone wines and somebody who helped me fall in love with Rhone varieties um, on in San Luis Obispo County and on the Central Coast was John Alvin of Alvin Vineyards. And John has been growing Rhone varieties in Edna Valley uh, forever. And just lo- particularly loved his Grenaches that he was growing out of the area. They had the light, um, beautiful aromatics and flavors that Grenache offers, but with this spice um, that almost just creates a whole other level of complexity within Grenache. Um, when it comes to Grenache in Paso, um, either wait for a vintage that I can use a fair bit of stems in to create a lot of spiciness and, and complexity within the palate. Otherwise, Grenache in Paso, I prefer to blend with. But Cool Climate Grenache in its own is is so much more of a standalone variety. And this this one in particular from the Rigetti Vineyard is stripped down. It was um, I did about 20% whole cluster on it. Um, completely unadulterated by acid or um, any other um, additives, and even and it was 100% neutral oak. There was no oak, no new oak on this wine at all. So it was very bare, uh, just blatant Grenache, just uh, pure to itself. And the Rigetti Vineyard, um, yeah, not very known of, but it's it sits in Edna Valley on the northwest northeast edge of the ABA. It sits right next to the first of the seven sisters, which is an ancient volcanic um, mountain range. So the soil texture of this vineyard is is all ancient volcanic. Mm-hmm. And they're 10 by 10 spaced uh, 
Spanish clone Grenache vines. And so they were intended to be dry farmed, but Don Rigetti planted it in the middle of the, uh, the drought. So dry farming them did not become viable. But the cool thing about this site is the composition of the soil during the summer, the ground just breaks apart into these huge crevices as um, the soil dries out. And that allows those vines that are planted 10 feet by 10 feet, their roots to just reach and spread. And it spoke within the wine to create this really complex and multifaceted Grenache. So it's beautiful. It's very light. And uh, it, honestly, it's dangerous because it's really, really good. What What is the, the 15 2? So uh, not at all blind tasting would never say 15-2 or, you know, it, it's so well balanced. The spice is, is beautiful. It's definitely blind tasting. I would say Grenache. Like, yeah, I think it does speak to the true essence of Grenache, but it, it is a lovely, it's lovely in color. The, the nose just, like begs you to to get it on your palate. It's it really is a beautiful wine, um, but the the there's cherry there's cherry like both red and black cherry in there. It's, a, it's all a very dry um, dry fruit profile. It's not jammy. It's not no. uh, it's not candied or anything like that. It's it's dry, which plays into the spice of the wine so well. There's nothing at odds about the wine. Yeah, it is, um, and the finish is like seconds and like going and going and going, continuing in like like a minute, like after a taste, a minute you're still you're still tasting that, and there is um, there's a nice amount of acidity in there that just holds that whole wine, the structure of the wine together, and not the the tannin is is just like peeking at you and, and saying hi to, to hold everything together. It's, I, I absolutely love it. What is the SRP on this? That one is 45 a bottle. Okay. That's not bad for, for that. that. That's beautiful. Um, all right. So your Syrah, the Annunciato. Yay. Mm -hmm. So I personally think this is probably one of the most famous vineyards that um, I think even people who don't know wine have at least heard of it or whatever. Um, so my question with this one is that how the heck did you get, how how did you get into that? But I think you said Nicora, right? He helped yeah. you? Like, yeah. So I, I was supposed to, um, Onyx has a block of, uh, of Sarai Bienacido as well that I've worked with, and it was one of the reasons I, I loved that wine so much that, I wanted to make one in my own style too because um, at the time in 2017 I didn't hold the title of winemaker at Onyx so I wanted it for my own portfolio and I was supposed to get some from the Onyx blog because it was going to yield a little bit more than they needed. Um, it ended up not being a very heavy crop year and Onyx had to take it all um, and so yeah. serendipitously well, and graciously uh, Nick Elliott over at Nicora had texted me like, hey, I heard you need some Bienacito. I have a couple boxes. Um, they're yours if you want them. And it was just so, so thoughtful. Um, I ended up buying um, with Nick again the same block in, in 2018 um, from Bienacito. So it just, I'm so grateful. Nick is such a good guy and he makes such incredible wine. So um, like I said, all uh, rising tide raises all ships and, and Nick is such a a great purveyor of that. That um, now I don't. I have in case I only opened one. Um, I only opened the Grenache, but like that. If somebody said, "Where would I want Syrah from?" That you know, that's mm -hmm. that's it. I mean, that's that's where it is. So now, are you? This is every vintage. Now you're making. I did one in in seventeen and eighteen. Um, Again, like I said, our uh, our production sometimes is very selfish in the way that I do things. Um, okay. And from 2018 to 2020, we went from no kids 
to two kids. Yeah. Um, we have <laughs> two children under the age of two, or at the time we did. Now they're two and a half and one. Um, and I had to, in 2019, simplify. And the time, I'm very much someone who likes to be in the vineyard very regularly. And with everything taking on the title of winemaker at Onyx and these kids and um, driving the hour and a half one-way trip down and checking on these vineyards as consistently as I wanted to um, was becoming less and less possible. So um, I, in 2019, started just pulling grapes from, from San Luis Obispo County. Oh, okay. Uh, so that I couldn't have an eye. I, I think this last Sunday, uh, Nora, my daughter, and I spent two hours in the car together checking on vineyards, and we were able to get eyes on every single vineyard that we are buying from this year. And I just uh, that was I, I liked that a lot better than I, otherwise. Yeah. I was having to wake up at like 4:30 in the morning and drive down there, check on things, get back. It was just a lot. Right. So you have you're going to have an, a budding winemaker with you. She's going, so. fall, she's going to fall in love with it. I don't know how you not fall in love with the vineyards when, when you get to walk around them and see them and um, just how they evolve over a season uh, is, is beauty. It, it, there's just no other, there's no other word for it to, to see how it goes from, you know, winter all the way through to um, harvest is just beautiful. Now, I think right now, sorry to cut you off yeah. um, before I forget, the, I think right now the thing that she loves the most is the fact that at most of these vineyards there's either and or a dog or chicken um, oh, at these okay. vineyards. So she, I think that's why she wants to go. Whenever I'm like, Nora, do you want to go to the vineyard? She's like, chickens? Chickens? <laughs> so... See, but it's, it's a memory. It's a good memory. She's going to associate good stuff with vineyard, and, you know, that's how it goes. <laughs> um, are you – I just was uh, Sunday walking the vineyard. We're just getting into – for the Cab Franc, we're just getting into uh, Verasion, uh, like one one berry per every other <laughs> cluster or whatever. So very, very soon. Um, where, where are you in terms of – of your Syrah and our Syrah last time I checked was actually over 50% done with Eurasian. Oh, okay. Um, the Morved that we're sourcing was um, about the same, a little bit over 50%. And then the Grenache that we sourced hadn't even started. <laughs> a, little, a little later. Um, Maved. Oh my God, I love Maved. And you're gonna, you're doing that as a single varietal also. Yeah, in 2018 we bottled some single varietal Maved from Alta Colina Vineyard. Oh my God. Oh yeah. my God, that's incredible. It's awesome. It's awesome. Yeah. My sister yeah. loves Maved. Um, there's a winemaker in Paso by the name of Ryan Pease, um, yep. who does a he has a label called Pacer Tear, and he's one of the first people to start making varietal Maved, and uh, myself and my sister were just blown away by his wines. They're like, we need to do some single varietal Morved too. Yeah, we uh, we know him from Brecken because right. now he's working out at Brecken too. Um, all right, so tightrope, Leonier, mm -hmm. wonderful great variety. Little rope. I know that's probably not coming out into the video very well, but there's a nice little rope. So story of the name. Mm -hmm. So the name is inspired by my, my sister, Tracy. Um, they themselves are entrepreneurs. They own three businesses, including the winery. Wow. Um, they have three kids, um, so our two. And needless to say, you know, I, thought, I think my life is busy and hectic. Their life is like our life on steroids. It is hectic. <laughs> I, sometimes it's really hard to just to get a phone call in with each other. Like I'll, we'll get a really productive phone call going, and then Michael be like, "Well, Lila just fell off the couch, so I gotta go." <laughs> and um, that's just kind of like how we're navigating life right now, and navigating this business is with um, a lot going on around us, and okay. and we wouldn't have it any other way. We love it, um, but it's it's very hectic and very busy, and and Tracy many times has has said that it. Um, feels like 
living on a tight ro- tightrope or walking on a tightrope, and you know, one little thing in the day can just cause everything to come tumbling down. Um, and she loves white wine, and there's probably other people like this too, but she always says that after a really hectic day, a day where things didn't go right necessarily, or just something that just felt like a really heavy day, um, she reaches more for a white wine. That's her decompressor is a white wine. And um, so I made this white wine for her, uh, named it the tightrope so that after a really hectic day, she can go sit on her back porch and she can open it and enjoy it. (laughs) So that's, this one's for crazy. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. And now, I did. Are these um, uh, indigenous yeast, natural, or are you using commercial? I use commercial, um, selective ones. I really, for white wine, um, I choose a yeast called X16. Um, mm-hmm. That is a little bit more um, expressive of um, of phenols. I'm really looking for a highly aromatic white wine. It's not done in oak. It's all stainless steel um, and early to bottle to capture a lot of inherent uh, CO2 in the wine. Um, it's much in the way that I make the, the white wines at, at uh, Onyx as well. And I, especially with Viognier, which tends to be a more heavy bodied, maybe um, pushing the edges of oily at times right. in its texture. Um, with this, with Viognier, we strive to find vineyards that are, one, highly acidic, and two, then we couple that with a stainless steel fermentation early to bottle freshness um, that just cuts right through that texture, and it creates a much more sharp, crisp, uh, more refreshing style of Viognier. Well, I'm going to thank you for that because that's my style of Viognier, that um, I'm not I'm not a fan of that oiliness, the... You know, I, I want that crispness. I, I I want that. I'm tired. I want to chill. I want my feet up, and I want to enjoy this wine. Yeah. Um, I don't typically, when I have a Viognier, I don't typically drink it with anything. It's hmm. that's what I'm just drinking it and enjoying that. You know, um, that's one of my favorite sushi wines. Is is a, a more lean style of Viognier. Because right. it just has so much um, primary aromatic and flavor that just is, it's really really nice with fresh fish. Well, I don't do that stuff. I don't do sushi. <laughs> I don't do fish of any sort. Uh, okay. So I just want that crispness. I want I want those aromatics. The thing that I love about Viognier is like you put it up to your nose and it the aromas just take you take you away. Um, the the aromatics of are, are amazing with Viognier's and then I don't want that weighted down like I, I ba- unbalanced is not the right word but I'm going to use it um a Viognier that that oily that that heavy bodied one when it, it still has a Viognier aromatic profile so I, when I put it up for me when I put it up to my nose I get all light I get all you know happy and and then when I taste it and it's a fuller bodied and it's got that oil, it, it's, an, it's a it yin and a yang. Yeah. yeah. And it's not that the wine is bad, it's not that it's out of balance, but for me, I like the uplifting part of the Viognier. I don't like that. that so. Same. So, all right. Now, this one, 11. So, I have to say, when I listened to the, po- the podcast you did previously, I was so taken off the rails by why you said it was named Eleven, because I'm listening to it, I'm listening to it, and I'm like, oh, Eleven, okay, the Eleven AVAs of Paso, there we go. <laughs> and then, oh. <laughs> nope. <laughs> what an opportunity. <laughs> So tell the story of eleven. <laughs> well, I guess in the future I'm gonna have to find grapes from all eleven uh, AVAs and try and piece it together. Um, <laughs> but no, this this uh, this wine again inspired by my sister Tracy. Um, she's someone who says that she sees the number eleven everywhere, and I think this is somewhat of a universal thing where there's a lot of people out there who you know they look at the clock at eleven eleven all the time and. Um, we dug into it a little bit more to figure out what people say about it. And supposedly it's supposed to be a sign from the universe that you're on the right track. 
and again tying into how busy our lives are all the time and um, uh, it's supposed to be a little reminder to calm down, don't worry, everything's right in the world, you don't need to stress about it. Um, and in a lot of ways that's um, our approach to wine is, is it's really a lifestyle thing for us. We, um, we want to we want to do winemaking. We want to be in this business because we, we love doing it. Um, so although it gets hectic with the kids and the work and, um, it's a nice little reminder every once in a while, either by, um, looking at the clock or opening a bottle of that wine that we're on the right track, that we're doing what we love. And it, it's just a, a gentle reminder. <laughs> and the feathers? That the represent- feathers. Um, so all the artwork, um, is done by an artist named Dane Curley. Uh, he's a super talented guy. Um, you can look him up. But I told him that this is a label that's going to change every once in a while, and it's supposed to kind of um, subjectively or implicitly show the number 11. So the label having two fe- feathers right next to each other are supposed to somewhat subtly um, look Say like it. an 11. Oh, okay. That's fun. That's fun. That's, um, oh, if imagery, mm-hmm. right? They have, they, they don't do it anymore, but we used to have so much fun trying to find the Pantheon in all of their labels. So there you go. Yeah. That's, that's your version of it. That's fantastic. But I did, when I heard 11, I was like, oh my God, that's, well, obviously the 11 ABA is in the <laughs> And then you continued with the story. I was like, wait a second. Oh, no. Okay. Completely off the rail. That wasn't even close. It wasn't even close. It's a great. I mean, I know uh, Austin Hope here in town has made some great Cabernet, in which he touts that his Cabernet comes from all the AVAs of Paso, which I think is such a a cool concept. And um, but for now, you know, we only source from four to five vineyards total. Right. Uh, so we're gonna have to do a little bit of growing if we're gonna be well, buying grapes we- from every single uh, <laughs> district. I know, yeah. There's the future. There you go. <laughs> All right. So are you um, ready to play our little game of opposites? Let's do it. All right. Super simple. I'm going to start off with non-wine terms, and then we'll get into wine terms. No right or wrong answer. Just wing it, whatever you think of first. All right? Okay. Here we go. Night or day? Day. Sunset or sunrise? Sunset. Walk or run? Run. Food or drink? Drink. Old world, new world? New world. Sweet or dry? Dry. Red or white? Red. Bubbles or still? Still. Oak or stainless? Stainless. Drink now or later? Later. I think I know this one. Blender varietal. Varietal. But as you know, I do a lot of blending too at Onyx. I love them. Right. Right. Um, they, they both have their true advantages. Yeah. Um, vintage or non-vintage? Vintage. Cork or screw cap? Cork. Napa or Sonoma? Napa. Commercial or indigenous? Indigenous. Bordeaux or Rhone? Rhone. <laughs> Warm climate, cool climate. Oh, man. Warm climate, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's it. That's it. Um, yeah, you kind, of, you kind of have to say warm climate. But when I get to winemakers, you know, then you can say, well, it depends on the varietal. I know. Like, like, that, was, uh, that, was, I, that may have been more fun for me just because it was like internal struggle. I kind of enjoyed that. I had to, I had to face some hard truths in myself. <laughs> and I get it. Like our, our Shannon is not coming from Paso, you know, um, and that was a, that was a struggle for us. So I get it. I get it. Um, so you are opening a tasting room on Peachy Canyon uh, very soon. So people can find you there. What about social media? If somebody wants to get in contact with you to place an order or to find out more about your wine, where is the best spot for them to find you? We have, an, we have a great website. Um, I would urge everybody to go check out the website, www.ninaofamilywines.com. 
Um, all of our social links are on the website too, but otherwise uh, on Instagram we're at NinaoFamilyWines.com or at NinaoFamilyWines. Um, you can find us on Facebook, same thing, Nino Family Wines. Uh, my sister runs all of the social media because she is inherently much more talented at that kind of thing than I am. Um, but it's, she has done a great job since she's taken over the, the social meds, as I call them. And uh, it's just a really fun time. I enjoy watching the story, and it's just really entertaining. So, all right. So uh, Instagram is your main social media? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And go on out. Pa Paso is open, people. So get your butts to Paso. Um, there's loads of places that we taste outside, so that's all good. And what did you say it was like a thousand square foot pa deck? Deck you have now? Yeah, the deck we can host up upwards of four groups just on the deck. Um, and I would urge people if they if they want to make an appointment, um, there will be a function on our website to do so, um, but otherwise you can email us at info at ninaofamilywines.com um, if you want to book a reservation. Okay. We're going to be open Thursday to Sunday um, from 10 to 4. Okay. And just all about make the reservation so that it helps them know who's coming and when they're coming and you get the best experience. And I, can, I know it's going to be a personalized experience with you. Um, you know, so they're going to want to do that. Um, did I miss anything? Did you want to say anything um, that we didn't discuss? No, I just always like to um, extend a huge amount of gratitude for um, to you for doing this platform and taking the time. I know what kind of effort it takes to uh, record and edit and put out this kind of content, and uh, I personally love listening to podcasts and and interviews with other winemakers, so I'm just thankful of the people out there that are taking the time to do so, because it's like a like refereeing and, and officiating volleyball, it's somewhat thankless sometimes. So thank you so <laughs> much for uh, joining us and giving us the time to, to you know get the name out there. Oh, well, thank you, and um, I will uh, stop by maybe on um, maybe ch oh well, you're not there tomorrow, are you? You're you're vacationing. I was going to say, maybe I'll stop by and say hi uh, after my juicy IPA <laughs> tomorrow. But um, next time, when you're back in town, I'll stop by and we'll see. And uh, I'll take a little stop off at the at, to the tasting room and take some pictures for my for my Instagram. So, please, please. Whether you're in Tin City or you're up on Peachy Canyon Road, just let me know when you're in town. I will. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your evening. We did not have any children running through, so our YouTube no. will not go viral. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Enjoy your evening. Have a great day, and uh, I'll catch up with you in Pasta one of these days. Sounds good. I'm going to go take a swim with uh, with Nora, and, and uh, yeah, we'll, I'll talk to you soon. All right. Have a good night. You too. Bye. Bye. Bye.